Well, all right. Uh, so Mike, thanks for joining me today uh, to talk about the CARES Act. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know you, uh, care to just share who you are and what you do? Sure, thanks for having Dan. Um, my name's Mike Ferris. I'm a CPA, practice in Longmont, Colorado, serving primarily small business owners, helping them with tax planning and compliance issues throughout the year. Okay. So uh, the CARES Act is already already law, it's already in effect. So talk to us about the Paycheck Protection Program that's supposed to be starting today. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, this is a, an amazing source of liquidity for at least a short-term period for almost every business in the country. There's an, a, a presumption of economic impact from the coronavirus issues that we're all dealing with that makes this loan program available to just about every business that was already in existence in February of this year. It provides money to the business to help them fund their payroll and their rent and utilities, just their, you know, their very basic operating costs for, for an eight week period of time. And then there's a lot of you know, nuances and ifs, ands, and buts about how you get to that number. But in a nutshell, it's eight weeks worth of liquidity that doesn't have to be paid back necessarily if you if you follow all the rules okay so does somebody just call up the the government and say hey i need a loan how, do, how does somebody actually get involved in that program <laughs> no it's being administered through banks the sba is back in the program and they're running the program through national and local banks so the, the the advice would be to call your banker that you work with and talk to them some banks are using the federal application i think other banks are, are developing their own application but in a nutshell, you're going to document what your payroll costs were over the last 12 months, and and then some. And there's a couple of other things that add in. Independent contractors can add into that total. So you'll you'll document your payroll costs, your 1099 costs, and they'll might want to see some tax returns just to close the loop on documentation. But and then, and you establish what your borrowing base is, and satisfy the bank that that's the right number, and and go from there. Okay. So does this essentially any business that's been open since February qualifies for this or are there any, any exceptions? Like if I'm a self-employed sole proprietor or something, am I, am I carved out of this at all? No, you're not. And that's one of the interesting things about this. The, the SBA application asks for payroll costs and, and that might make you think, well, I'm a self-employed person. I don't have any payroll, so I don't qualify, but that's not true. The way they wrote the bill, when Congress drafted this, it, it seems to me pretty clear that congressional intent was to try to provide a mechanism so that everybody that was getting a paycheck in February before the virus impacted us all is going to continue to get a paycheck at least for eight weeks after the virus has kind of come out into the world with us. And so self-employed people are were allowed to include in the term payroll costs, were allowed to include the income of somebody that's self-employed. We can also include um, payments made by a business to, <clears throat> to self-employed people. So if you're giving somebody a 1099 for the work they do for you as a commission or, or just contract labor, they don't, they're not an employee, you can include that payment as well as your payments to other employees and your own self-employed income in this calculation. No, so that's a pretty, pretty broad brush. So, I mean, how, how do we cap this off? If I've made, if I'm, let's say, self-employed or, or my payroll was, um, you know, let's say $50,000, um, what, what would that actually be limited at? Well, we're going to end up calculating an average monthly payroll number. So okay. we would, and, and, and getting to the totals that we use to calculate the average, we can only include compensation up to $100,000 for every person. So if everybody in your payroll makes less than $100,000, that's not a problem. Your 1099 pay, payees, those are limited to $100,000 each. And the self-employed comp for the owner is also capped at $100,000. So there are some limits, but you end up getting a monthly average number over a 12-month time frame, and then two and a half times that monthly average becomes the amount of money you can borrow. Gotcha. So uh, obviously, I think there's been a lot of uh, stuff thrown out there in kind of the news, and I, and I keep reading the phrase free money. Um, yeah. so how does that exactly kick in here? Well, I, I, the free money concept comes from the idea that this is a forgivable loan. The other term I've seen used, they've called it the PPP grant program. But um, so there's but there's qualifiers, right? You're gonna you're gonna qualify for the money. You're gonna borrow the funds that you document you need, 
And then they're going to test how you spent the money. So what did you do with the money you borrowed? And in, in an eight week time frame, if you can document that you spend it on salary for your employees, rent for the business, utilities for the business, self-employed compensation for the owner up to these same hundred thousand dollar limits based, you know, prorated. And then you can also include business mortgage interest and in some cases other interest on other business debt. So that fairly short list of things though, which is heavily focused on payroll, um, if you spend the borrowed money on those qualified expenses in the eight week time frame following the date of the loan, then you're eligible for full forgiveness. Now there's another catch there too. You've got to keep your employee level at least as the same as it was a year ago. So we'll look at the ratio of your average employees from February to June of 2020 over the average number of employees from February to June of 19. And if that's less than 100%, then you don't qualify for full forgiveness. So, so you've got to maintain your employee levels from a year ago or, or increase them. And you've got to spend the money on the qualified expenses. And if you do those two things, you qualify for forgiveness of this loan. And then it kind of starts feeling like free money, I guess. Sure. So what if I was already in the process of spinning my business down or having to lay people off or furlough people? Do, can, you, can you hire people back in to meet that criteria? Or have you already, already missed it? Yeah, if, you've, if you laid somebody off a week ago under this program, or because of the virus impact on your business, one of the intents of this package is to cause you to bring them back. So bring them back, pay them this way. Hopefully at the end of eight weeks, things are getting back to normal and you've got work for these people again. This is meant to be a short-term fix to kind of cover a gap that we hope ends before the money runs out. Sure. So what happens if I have expenses that aren't forgivable or the government says I don't qualify or, or some part of it doesn't qualify? Yeah, you, you borrow $50,000 and for whatever reason, you only spend 40 of it on the qualified things. You've got $10,000 that doesn't qualify for forgiveness. That becomes a loan. And I guess we got some new regulations this morning, I think, that tell us that's going to be a, a two-year loan amortized at no less than 1%. And I think it can't be any higher than four or something like there's some parameter. You may know more about that, but anything you can't get forgiven becomes a loan and it's paid back under relatively favorable terms. Sure. I mean, it, it seems, I, I think it's more generous than my mortgage when you get down to it. <laughs> it probably is. Yeah. Okay. So then what else came out, out of this act? Uh, I mean, we've, we've been hearing in the news about individual checks going out and, and that sort of thing. So what else is in there? That's the other, the other big highlight that affects so many people is the stimulus checks. Um, similar to what was done in 2008 and, and maybe one other time, a few years prior to that, the government's going to mail every taxpayer that's got a social security number a, a check. And if you're a single person, <clears throat> you're going to get a $1,200 check. And if you're a married filing joint couple, then that couple gets a $2,400 check. There's an additional $500 for every qualifying child, and that's children under age 17 in the household gets um, another $500 added to that. Their income phase outs, if your income, if you're single and your income's over 75,000 or 150,000 for the joint couple, then the, the, the benefit starts kind of phasing down. And once you get to, uh, I forget the numbers, I think 98,000, 198, something like that, 100, close to 200,000 for the joint return then your benefit goes to zero. And they're gonna base these, because we're right in the middle of the filing season and, and probably a solid two thirds of the country hadn't filed a return yet. The, um, the payment will be based on an estimate and, and they're gonna look at the most recent return they've got on hand, 18 or 19, and whatever your adjusted gross income was on that return will be the basis for this payment. Now, Having said all that, this all gets recalculated in 2020. This is an advance of a tax credit you're going to get on your 2020 return. So a lot of people will get a check for $1,200 or $2,400, and that'll be the same as their credit in their 2020 return. Everything's good. There will be people whose income goes up and gets a larger credit than they're entitled to in the ultimate calculation. They may have to pay some of that back. There will also be people whose income goes down, especially maybe this year as a result of all the virus nonsense, where somebody had 
you know, 180,000 of adjusted gross income in 2019, and they got a reduced stimulus payment when they do their 2020 return, they're under that threshold now, and they may actually get a, a, an increase in their refund because of the change in the credit. So okay. that's, that's one of the big things for individuals. There's, there's a host of other provisions in this package. There's, some, there's a program of employee tax, payroll tax credits, for businesses that don't take advantage of the PPP program, they'll have an ability to take payroll tax credits for the salaries they pay their employees in the second, third, and fourth quarters. Um, there's a handful of other corrections they made. The, one of the biggest things they did, especially for the restaurant industry, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act 2017 had an error in the drafting that removed leasehold improvements from the class of property eligible for bonus depreciation. And if you opened a restaurant in 2018, you probably had a lot of money in leasehold improvements and you were limited in what your depreciation could be. <clears throat> They've corrected that language, <clears throat> excuse me, and they made the effective date of that correction all the way back to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act date. So that offers up an ability to possibly amend some 2018 returns or deal with it through some other technical correction issues in 2019 or 20 returns, offers opportunities for folks to get benefits they, would, they weren't entitled to before. Sure, and is that the same as kind of some of the information we've seen coming out about the net operating losses or the changes there? There's also changes there too. They, the, one of the things I'm excited about, and it kind of dovetails with the change in depreciation, but they any thumb, any any net operating loss from 2018 or 19 or 20 will be able to be carried back for five years and that means if we have a loss in our 2019 tax return that we're doing right now we can go backwards to 2014 15 16 and recover income tax we paid in those years sure. and the tax cut and jobs act had taken that ability away from us so we saw something that we were able to use to benefit taxpayers got taken away from us and now they've they've given it right back so we've got potential refund opportunities and you know if you had a if you if you've had a situation where you can now go claim bonus depreciation that you weren't entitled to until this technical correction you could potentially amend the 2018 return create a net operating loss with the bonus depreciation and then go recover tax that was paid in 2013 and 14 and in, impact your cash flow that way. So it depends on circumstances, but if there's a lot of opportunities there for a lot of businesses. Another change they made deals with charitable contributions. We're gonna get for 2020, we're gonna be able to take um, what we call an above the line deduction for $300 of cash charitable contributions made. And that'll, that'll be a reduction of adjusted gross income. So it's only $300, but it's, $300. Sure. There's also for charity, the other big change for 2020, there is no limit relative to taxable income on the amount of your charitable donation deduction. Man. Historically, Man. we've Man. always been limited and could deduct 50% or lately it's been 60% of your taxable income as charity. Now that's essentially a hundred. Okay. So somebody could, you know, if they have all the money they need right now, could theoretically write off the, all of their income this year. You could. You could donate all your money to the Firehouse Arts Center and generate a, and, and, and get your income down to zero. <laughs> there's a, there's a, good, uh, a good strategy right there. So what, what else has come out about, about this? Uh, I mean, we, we've seen, you mentioned some of the payroll kind of tax credits or something. Can you, can you say more about that? Yeah, well, the payroll tax credits are there, and, and I may get this wrong. It's been a day or two since I looked at the details. Um, if you will be able to take credits against payroll taxes up to, I think it's $5,000 per employee over the course of the rest of the calendar year. So if you, if you participate in the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, that's not available to you. So for the businesses that choose not to, to take part in that program, they'll be able to use payroll tax credits and reduce their payroll tax expense for the balance of the fiscal year. So essentially, are, are you saying that I can effectively take $5,000 off of my payroll taxes when I have to pay them by the end of the year? As long as you pay people enough to generate that much, yeah. Yeah, okay. essentially. Well, There's that applies to- There's there. You've got to, you can't 
the, the pay to the employee has to be relative to what it was in the 30 day period prior to the act being passed. Um, and, th and there may be a couple of other nuances, but that's a fairly straightforward payroll tax credit limited to the first to $10,000 of pay per employee capped at I think five grand. So. Now, does that apply to the same self-employed or sole proprietor folks? Mm -hmm. It does. Self-employed people can take advantage of this. And essentially, you wind up being able to reduce your estimated tax payments for the individual, for the self-employed individual. He can reduce his self-employed or his estimated tax payments that are due in July and September for this. Sure. But I was reading somewhere that you don't have to pay your taxes until the end of next year. Is that true? Well, there's a program that's elective. And, and this one could be, could be fabulous, but it's got a lot of risk, I think. So there's, a, there's an ability to defer the payment of half of the payroll tax for up to two years for part of it. So without getting too deep in the weeds, you, you pay half your payroll tax when it's due currently. The other half gets deferred and half of the deferred amount comes due at 12-31-2021 and the other half remainder comes due at 12-31-2022. If you make the payments at those dates, you're treated for penalty purposes as if you paid them timely when the payrolls were run in 2020. If you get all the way to 2022 and miss that last payment by a day, penalties get recalculated all the way back to the payroll dates in 2020, and that could be absolutely disastrous. Sure. So that sets up a potential problem, but for the responsible business that can manage cash flow and deal with that, that's an ability to have some current savings. Sure. Uh, and I think the last thing I was seeing was a, a bunch of stuff about retirement accounts. Yeah, so let's change there. Yeah, we got to cover retirement stuff. That's some of the more important things. Sure. Um, for, for 2020, there is no requirement to make required minimum distributions from IRA plans. So if you had already started RMDs in the past or you were going to start one this year, you get a free year, so there's no RMD requirements. And, and that's interesting, you, you think, shouldn't we be trying to get money to people, not cause them not to take money? But RMDs, and the way I think about this, and you may have a perspective that's more accurate or, or better, but it, it feels like if we don't force retirees to take RMDs, we're, we're preserving their, their portfolio and not causing them to sell positions in a terrible down market. I think so we're preserving income for the future really by doing that it feels like and it, it almost feels like it'd be a, a great idea to just pass like a bear market legislation that this rule just kicks in anytime the market goes into a bear market anytime the market declines a certain amount this rule kicks in and we preserve income for future periods yeah the, yeah. Um, the other issue with retirement plans is if if somebody is impacted by this disease and is kind of compelled because of disease factors to take to need to take money from their retirement plan, there's an ability to, to not have the 10% penalty tax apply for what would otherwise be an early distribution. So somebody that's not yet 59 and a half years old is laid off of work or they're sick and they can't work and they need their retirement plan money for, for income to live off of, without any other provisions, there'd be a 10% penalty applied to that distribution. But for 2020, that penalty provision is waived. So that could be real beneficial to some people that are, you know, being negatively impacted by this thing. Now, do I have to take that all this year right away? Is there is there any way to make that less of a tax bill? Well, there is. Yeah, you can you can include the income from that distribution rateably over a three year period. So you get a third, a third, and a third. So you spread that income out over three years. That might help keep you in lower brackets than it would be. You can also repay that that distribution back over a three year period as well. Okay. And put the money back in the plan. Now, is that just being treated like a, a really long 60-day rollover? Essentially, yeah. <laughs> it's good to uh, look at it. Now, how would you recover that? Let's say you take it out this year, you pay your taxes this year, and then you put, a, put it back in next year. Do you just get that back on your return? The year I believe before? you get treated as if you made a qualified contribution. Oh. I'm, not, I'm not entirely certain. I've kind of wondered that, too, from an application standpoint, how that really works. But. Gotcha. Okay. Well, is there anything we, we didn't talk about that you think folks need to know about the act? You know, the biggest thing is this PPP program that's live and on fire right now. Some banks are taking applications. 
my hunch is that the program will run out of funds before everybody that's in line for it will get funded. So my advice would be to, you know, get in touch with your bankers today or to, as soon as possible and let them know you want to try to participate. It's, it's a pretty easy application. Honestly, there's a handful of data points to gather and, and you know, your accountants and, and other providers can kind of help with that. I'm sure. But that, that is the main event. My a colleague of mine called that the big kahuna of the whole bill. Gotcha. And if somebody wants your help, uh, what, what do they need to expect there? How, do, how should they reach out? Best way to reach me is over the phone right now, probably at my phone number, 720-621-3456. And our, you know, we're in the office working. We're kind of close to the public, but we are in the office working, taking calls and trying to help folks deal with all this stuff. Okay. And do they have to pay you as, a, as an accountant to get any of this stuff worked on or? Well, we can have short conversations and, and you know, make sure we, we're, we've got the right ideas and the right ability to help folks. But once we do a little bit, we start trying to recover some of our time. Oh. Makes sense. So I'm trying to be, you know, I think a lot of my role in the community with stuff like this is to generate awareness and, and share information. And I'm, I want to do that for the community. And, and if I can help some folks at the same time and, and get paid a little bit along the way, then that's all the better. Sure. Uh, I think <laughs> y'all got to work for a living. <laughs> we do. Okay. Well, Mike Ferris, uh, CPA, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dan.